Oh, thank you very much, Betts, and, and, and thank you, you yourself and the other organisers for inviting me today. It's, it's really a privilege to be here and, and great to see so many people out in the audience here. And, and yes, you're right, uh, I have been on a speaking tour sponsored by the Royal Society of New Zealand the last couple of months with my colleague Tim Nash who runs the Antarctic Research Centre at Victoria. And actually we haven't, it's not over yet, we have another series of talks coming up in a couple of weeks uh, and we'll be coming to Auckland uh, in about, I think it's about two weeks from now, I, I forget the date exactly, but if, you, if you're on Google and you try Googling Royal Society Climate Change, um, you'll find us. So, so look out for that. Um, so, this, uh, this presentation I've got today is, is based somewhat on the presentation I gave at the conference that Betsy mentioned we had at Victoria in February, and the, the title slide there is a picture of the winds associated with a couple of tropical cyclones that were active in the Pacific at the time of the conference, and that's, uh, that's a theme I'll return to uh, towards the end of the, the talk. So this is, a, this is a science talk, so I expect a few graphs. I sort of feel a bit sorry about that, but, but this, is, this is the world I operate in. So um, here, here's the main one, and you, you may well have seen this picture many times before. What it shows is time runs along the bottom there from the late 1950s to the present, and the vertical scale there is um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, in parts per million, so it's, it's a, just a trace component of the atmosphere, but it's a very important trace component. And you might ask, why, why do we all talk about carbon dioxide? Well, there's only two ways you can change the climate. You can make the sun brighter or dimmer, so you have more or less sunlight falling on the earth, or you can change the amount of so-called greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere. These are the ones that absorb the heat that the Earth sends up the space. The Earth is warmed by the sun, so it, it releases heat to space. If we didn't have these gases in the atmosphere, the Earth's surface temperature would be around 30 degrees lower than it is, and life really wouldn't be possible. So the fact we have these trace elements in the atmosphere means that the, the Earth, as we experience it, it, experience it, is much warmer than it would be otherwise. And carbon dioxide is the gas that stays in the atmosphere the longest, hundreds of years, thousands of years for a fraction of it. So it's very important to keep track of. So that's, that's why we care about carbon dioxide and the fact that it's increasing. But you might look at this graph and think, well, so what? It's going up. You know, it's gone from 320 parts per million to just over 400 parts per million now. It doesn't look that startling. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that this is just a, about a 60-year uh, time period, something like a human lifetime. And the way the climate system and the ice sheets and the oceans respond to these kinds of things uh, is on much longer timescales. This is the longest record we've got of carbon dioxide directly taken from the atmosphere. But uh, we can use little bubbles of air that are trapped in the ice on the big ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. Cut holes in the ice, pull the ice out, melt, melt the ice and release the, the bubbles of air and measure the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the air years, thousands, millions of years ago, well, hundreds of thousands of years ago anyway. Uh, and as you go down through the ice, you go further back in time. And when you do that, you get a much better sense of, of how the Earth feels about this. So if you, instead of going back 60 years, you go back 13,000 years, this is the picture you get. So the, the blue part at the end is the, the information I showed on the last slide, the uh, measurements at Mauna Loa in Hawaii of carbon dioxide, and then the red and the green lines are from ice cores. And you can see over thousands of years, the change we've had in carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution, the last couple of hundred years, is extremely fast in terms of the way the Earth operates. Uh, carbon dioxide concentrations have been increasing very slowly for a few thousand years, and then suddenly when we discovered fossil fuels and started taking all this carbon out of the ground and burning it, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased 
extremely fast, almost in an instant as far as the, the climate system is concerned. So the, uh, the climate is starting to respond to this, but it will take time for it to adjust fully, even to the amount that's in the atmosphere right now. So I'll just go through some of the, the ways the climate's changing at the moment and then talk a little bit about how the climate might change in the future, depending on the action we take or, or don't take. So this is a, a graph, yet another graph of, of temperatures averaged around the world at, at the Earth's surface where we live. And it's relative to the pre-industrial temperature, that is the temperatures that were measured back in the mid 19th century. That's about as close as we can get to genuinely pre-industrial. So that's, that's where the zero line is on the vertical scale there. You can see the temperatures going up to 1.4 degrees above pre-industrial and, and down to 0.4 below. And we've got time along the bottom again from 1880 to uh, 2015. And last year, 2015, was the warmest year on record so far over the last 130, 140 years. Probably the period, the last few years, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, we can say is the warmest spell we've had for over a thousand years, and that probably applies to the globe. You can see it's not, it doesn't just get a little bit warmer every year. There are El Nino events, the volcanoes go off and that blocks out some sunlight. So the temperatures go up and down, but the, the trend is very definitely upwards. And 2015 was the first year that broke through one degree above pre-industrial. And you may know that this year is, is already looking warmer than 2015 was. We've only had, we've got seven months worth of um, global temperatures. And if the rest of the year continued as warm as the first seven months, then the bar for this year would look like this. So it would be about one and a quarter degrees above pre-industrial. Probably won't come in quite that warm, but it'll be close to be more than 1.2, I suspect. And uh, the big meeting that happened in Paris at the end of last year, uh, and that was signed off uh, in April of this year, and the New Zealand government has just agreed they're going to ratify the Paris Agreement before the end of this year, so this is great news. Um, the Paris Agreement, states that the globe will work to keep global warming below two degrees above pre-industrial. And preferably, and this is mostly at the urging of Pacific Island nations and some African states, keep warming to something close to one and a half degrees, uh, or as close to that as possible. Well, we're already, at least on for some years, we're getting close to one and a quarter degrees above pre-industrial. So, Time on that basis is pretty short. If we're going to stop the warming soon, you can see it's been pretty steady for the last 50 or 60 years. We really have to make some changes around um, our emissions of, of carbon dioxide and other gases. And as the temperature rises, even this, you might say, well, it's only a degree or so. That's probably quite nice. And I was talking to somebody at coffee break saying, well, it's nice that it's 20 degrees in August and in Auckland, they don't have to wear a heavy jacket. And that's true, but um, yeah, there are, there are downsides. As you increase the temperature a bit, you increase the chances of getting a very uh, hot day. Um, the amount of moisture in the air depends on the temperature, so heavy rainfall events become more frequent. Forest fires become more likely, and in California and the west of um, North America, we're seeing a lot of that uh, as we speak. So there are a, a lot of um, Extreme events that you don't really see in the averages here that are really what concern people. But that warming of the atmosphere is only a tiny part of the story. The, the extra warming of the atmosphere from um, greenhouse gases that gets radiated back down to the earth, over 90% of that extra warming is going into the oceans. Only, only a couple of percent is warming the atmosphere directly. So most of the actions in the ocean, and the oceans take a very long time to warm up and respond, so we haven't seen the full story uh, in terms of global warming even now, even with the amount of carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere. So you can look at, you can look at the amount of heat going into the ocean or, or the warming of the ocean effectively. So this is the total amount of energy in the ocean that's changed over the last 60 years or so. So the, again, time along the bottom here and uh, different measurements. Going through time, we have a lot more accurate measurements. This is the top 
half of the global oceans, about the oceans on average about 4,000 metres deep. This is the top 2,000 metres. And you can see that the heat content has been going up very steadily, quite rapidly in the last few years. Although just in the last couple of years it's actually dropped away a little bit and that's because we've had a big El Nino event, which means that the atmosphere takes up more heat and that's why the warming has been and the atmosphere has been so rapid lately. But overall, when you add it all up, the amount of heat in the climate system has been increasing steadily for a very long time. And the, the, the vertical scale there is units of heat, um, and the, the way it's written, 10 to the power of 22 joules, you've got to put 22 zeros on the end of those numbers to get the, the number of heat units. A joule is not a large unit of energy, but these are very large amounts of energy going into the ocean. Uh, it's a bit hard to get your head around how much energy actually. I think on this scale, about one and a half of those units uh, equates to about a million years of energy use in New Zealand. So it's a great deal of energy and it will take a long time for the oceans to adjust to that amount of change and, and the total amount of heat there. Now I, I don't have a picture of sea level rise but I know sea level rise is a main concern for, well, for everybody but especially the Pacific communities. We've had about 20 centimetres of sea level rise globally so far in, in the last hundred years. And whatever we do, because of the time lags of the ocean responding, whatever we do in the future, we know we're going to get at least another 30 centimetres or so in the next 50 years, roughly. How far it goes beyond that does depend on what we choose to do with emissions. But um, we're probably up for something like a metre more sea level rise over the coming century. It could be a lot more than that, but um, that's, that's the sort of locked-in number. Certainly 30 or so centimetres in 50 years, and maybe another 50 centimetres beyond that if we get our act together. So what about the future? Um, where, where to from here? Another graph. <laughs> Again, time along the bottom here, but now we're looking into the future. So the vertical line is, is just a few years ago, 2005. This is from the last report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So uh, again, temperature up the vertical axis changed from um, to the end of the 20th century. And we can see temperatures rising there through the 20th century or the second half of the 20th century. And then there are two lines going into the future. The blue, blue one you might call the Paris future, where we reduce emissions quite significantly over the next 50 years or so. And the temperature rise flattens out. There's some uncertainty, you can see the shading there, but something like another degree. So we, we stand a good chance of keeping global warming below two degrees if we follow that uh, Paris-related future. If we keep going the way we have the last 20 or 30 years, we follow essentially the red line and we see four or possibly more degrees of warming. This, again, there's a bit of uncertainty, but the warming would be much larger in the future if we don't take any action to reduce emissions. So we have a lot of, a lot of power over what the future will look like globally. You can see again that the two lines overlap for the next 20 years or so, and that goes along with that idea that sea levels are almost bound to rise by another 25 or 30 centimetres. Temperatures are bound to rise by another few tenths of a degree. But going out towards the end of the century, we do have a lot of control over where things go. Uh, the pattern of warming over the globe is not uniform, and I don't know if you can really make out the colours here. The, the point of this graphic is uh, this is per degree of global warming and you get a certain amount of warming in different places. Up in the Arctic, where the, the uh, warming is the greatest at the moment, it's expected that the warming will continue to be much larger there than it is over the rest of the globe. So for one degree of global warming, you would get two or more degrees of warming in the Arctic regions. And you may know that the, the sea ice and the snow around the northern continents is melting away very dramatically and we may well see uh, the Arctic Ocean completely ice-free in another few decades. In the New Zealand region, actually, to the south of us, the Southern Oceans are not warming so fast. But it's very, it's probably the, the hardest part of the globe to warm. The oceans to the south of us are very turbulent and they draw heat down to depth 
so they don't cool very fast at the surface. So New Zealand's expected to warm a little less quickly than the global average. And if you look into the, uh, into the South Pacific, uh, warming on average to the north of New Zealand um, at about the global rate. So if we get two degrees of global warming, you might expect to see about two degrees of warming across the South Pacific Island nations. But like I was saying before, that would go along with many more extreme hot days. The, temp the climate doesn't actually vary much in the tropics. So if you change the averages even a little bit, that changes the number of um, very warm events, changes the number of extreme rainfall events and so on. So again, it may not sound like much, but um, it would mean a big change in the frequency of different extremes. I've, I've mentioned heavy rainfall events. Oh, oh, yeah, so the more moisture in the air when it's warmer. And that's uh, because the amount of moisture that goes into the air is purely related to temperature. The warmer it is, the more moisture. The colder it is, the less moisture. So looking at, at rainfall then, um, this is another map from the IPCC report for the end of the century, uh, scaled per degree of warming. So if we had one degree of warming, we might see uh, three or four percent less rainfall over a lot of Australia and maybe uh, eight or nine percent more rainfall uh, along the equator and the convergence zones, the intertropical convergence zone. So um, generally what's happening here is that the subtropical regions such as Australia and the region just to the north of New Zealand are getting drier. Uh, they're already dry. Those regions are expected to get drier. And the very wet regions, the monsoon regions, the convergence zone regions in the tropics are expected to get wetter. So there's this um, motto that was used in the IPCC report, the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. And that theme that rainfall extremes are expected to go up in all directions, not only wetter when it's wet, but drier when it's dry as well. So that's, um, that's a big issue for water availability, water storage, and um, the availability of water for, for agriculture and so on. And for the South Pacific, there's a, a feature that's not really visible on that map. Uh, the, the South Pacific Convergence Zone, the SPCZ, uh, and the El Nino, La Nina phenomenon, that they affect seasonal rainfall very strongly in the South Pacific, and um, they are expected, well it's a bit uncertain how they will change actually, especially the El Nino cycle, but the South Pacific Convergence Zone, the region of heaviest rain across the tropical South Pacific, uh, that, that may be in for some major changes. I'll, I'll show a couple of pictures of that and then we'll wrap up. So um, I mentioned El Nino. Here's a, a map of sea temperatures from late last year, last summer, uh, and coming into February of this year. So that what I've shown here is temperatures of the sea surface as a difference from the average. So the red colours are where it's warmer than average and the blue colours are where it's colder than average. So in an El Nino it becomes much warmer than average along the equator uh, in the eastern Pacific. So the heaviest rain tends to follow the warmest sea temperatures in the tropics. So the rain that typically falls over Indonesia, Papua New Guinea and, and the western part of the Pacific moves out into the central and eastern Pacific. So and El Nino events often associated with droughts in places like Indonesia and maybe down into the, the Solomons and some of the western island nations in the Pacific and it tends to be a lot wetter than normal uh, further east and I know places like Kiribati tend to be very very wet in El Nino events. So what's going on with um, climate change? Uh, good question. <coughs> it's um, still, still uncertain really. Will there be more El Ninos? Will there be less El Ninos? Will they be weaker or stronger? Uh, it's still an open question exactly how the El Nino cycle will change. It's not going away. One thing that is pretty much for certain is that rainfall variations associated with El Nino events will get larger. And that theme that the wet get wetter and the dry get dry comes through, uh, even with El Nino events. <coughs> 
I mentioned um, the South Pacific Convergence Zone. This is a map of, of where it rains on average on the globe, and the, the white and blue colours are where it rains the most. You can see the tropical uh, monsoon and convergence regions, and that, that band that sits in the South Pacific and sort of moves down to the east of New Zealand and to the central South Pacific, that's the South Pacific Convergence Zone. So on average, the heaviest rain in the South Pacific lies along that line. But when there's an El Nino, it moves northeast. And when there's a La Nina, it moves towards the southwest. And there's an indication from the models, at least, that as the climate changes, we might see that convergence zone start to wave around more. And in fact, may flip up out of the way and sort of head to South America uh, and take the rainfall with it. So the chances of there being bigger variations in water availability of rainfall in the tropical South Pacific as time goes on looks, looks large. So these seasonal changes in rainfall across the tropical Pacific are uh, quite likely to get larger than they are at the moment. The last thing I really wanted to mention was tropical cyclones. Um, one of the major hazards in the South Pacific and in the tropical oceans generally. Um, we've had a number of, of extreme tropical cyclone events in the last few years and the question always is Will there be more uh, very intense tropical cyclones? Will there be more tropical cyclones generally? What, what's the future going to hold in terms of risks around these extreme wind and, and rainfall events? And the answer is, um, again, it's not entirely clear. Uh, this is another graphic from the, the last IPCC report. Um, Oh, it's a wee bit cryptic, I know. <laughs> uh, the vertical scale here is the percentage change, and I'll just, just let you know. So these, these four categories. The first one is the number of tropical cyclones. The second one is the, the number of very intense ones, category four and five. Then the duration of the cyclone at its maximum intensity, and the rainfall rate. So this is pretty, this is just for the South Pacific, but it's typical actually of a lot of the globe, the expectation is there will actually be less tropical cyclones in future, somewhat less, and, and this graphic suggests the average amount might be 20-25% less. So we typically get about 10 in the South Pacific Basin in a season at the moment, so maybe we'll see 8 or, or 7 on average, it'll still be a, a significant number of them, but the, the, the change in the number of very extreme cyclones, at least in the South Pacific. Um, insufficient data is what that little bit of text stands for. That there didn't seem to be any particular signal in any direction. And same with the duration. They didn't, didn't look as though cyclones are likely to last any longer or, or less, um, less duration than they do at present. But it's very clear that the, the rainfall rate is expected to increase. So we may have less cyclones they may not officially be stronger cyclones, but it's very likely they will be wetter cyclones. So when you get the extreme rainfalls, they will be more extreme. And it's also likely that the winds associated with a tropical cyclone will increase, even if the category that you put it in doesn't officially uh, become more extreme. When you look at the, the globe as a whole, here's, here's the picture. So for the globe as a whole, there is an indication that the number of very intense cyclones will increase. So you see a sort of 15 or 20 percent increase in the category four and five. Otherwise, the other numbers are, are similar to what we see for the South Pacific. So in some other basins, such as the Atlantic, there is an expectation there will be more uh, very intense cyclones. But uh, the jury is still out for the South Pacific. Either way, uh, it's very likely again that extreme rainfalls will become more extreme as these events happen. Alright, I think I've talked for far too long. So, oh sorry, yes, just to summarise, so cyclone numbers likely to be decreasing. Uh, the number of strong storms steady may increase, depends where you are on the globe, but either way the heaviest rainfall is very likely to, to increase. So just to summarise all that, so the, the South Pacific and, and New Zealand, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, uh, 
warming at about the global rate. So um, that means big increases in high temperature extremes and decreases in low temperature extremes. In New Zealand, for instance, frosts have become already much less common than they used to be, say, 40 or 50 years ago. More um, moisture and a warmer atmosphere, so that motto that the wet get wetter, but also, curiously, the dry get drier, so where it's dry, we expect things to become drier still. And that applies in New Zealand as well. The west, western region's likely to get wetter, eastern region's a little bit drier. For the South Pacific, the tropical Pacific, the, the movement of the South Pacific Convergent Zone is critical. So um, it's, it is looking as though the South Pacific Convergent Zone is likely to wave around, swing around more than it does at present which would lead to greater variability in rainfall and chances of both drought and flood, depending on whether you're under this thing or, or it's moved away from you. Uh, changes in El Nino uh, will be very important if they happen, but it's still uncertain as to whether or not this El Nino cycle will actually change. But whether it does or not, again, greater rainfall variability. So when you're in a wet region with an El Nino, likely to be wetter than it has been in the past. And if you're in an El Nino drought region, it's likely to be more intense drought than we've seen in the past. There may be more tropical cyclones in the future, but, uh, and a greater proportion of them may be strong, although that's not so clear for the South Pacific. But um, whatever happens there, uh, very likely we'll have heavier rain when these cyclones occur. And all of this has really quite major implications. I think the main concerns beyond sea level rise and, and the viability of, of low-lying um, locations, um, water availability, so food security, agricultural production, uh, has potentially could be very, very damaged. And we heard before we, we began this that um, production of some crops in the Pacific already um, badly affected and prices going up. So I think we may well see more of that in the future. <coughs> so I just wanted to finish off with a, a final slide, hopefully leading into to Adrian's presentation. So if we want to stop the warming at a couple of degrees or, or hopefully less, what do we have to do? And this is a graphic from a Ministry for the Environment report here uh, from last year. And it shows global emissions of carbon dioxide up the vertical axis there from the mid 19th century to the present and beyond. So you can see that emissions have gone up pretty steadily, very rapidly in the last few decades. And um, I think, uh, was it Matheson mentioned the idea of this budget of carbon, that there's only so much you can put in the atmosphere if you want to keep warming below two degrees or below any other number. And this, the, the estimate is to have a good chance, that is a 67% chance, two chances out of three, of keeping the warming below two degrees, there's this number of about nearly three trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide that can go into the atmosphere. And by 2011, we'd already put two thirds of that into the atmosphere. If we kept going at 2011 rates, uh, we would get to, we would have used the whole budget up within about 20 years from now. So. If we're serious about reducing the warming and stopping below two degrees, we really have uh, very little time to act. And I, I, I just wanted to share a little story. A friend of mine from uh, Niwa, who works, he's a climate researcher, he works in Auckland, he visited me the other day. And he's been doing research on climate change and climate variations for years. And it's been a sort of scientific interest, but um, he and his wife had a, a child recently and they've got a young daughter now. And he, he sat down with me for coffee and he said, now I'm really worried about climate change. It was, it's always been interesting, but now I'm really concerned and what can I do? How can we stop this happening? And I think that's right. The climate is changing now and it is affecting us now, but I think it's our children who are going to be affected most strongly by this. And, and I think... Uh, those of us who have families feel that and, and we know that we really have to look to the future and think about where things are going. So on that note, I'll just say that uh, according to the numbers, roughly speaking, if we want to 
to stop below 2 degrees, we really need to go to zero emissions within about 60 years, or certainly by the end of the century, at the latest, I would say. And then some of the, the, the scenarios that really keep us below 3 degrees have what are called negative emissions. That means we come up with ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We don't have these ways yet, but certainly a number of people are working on that. And that gives us a 67% chance of succeeding. And, you know, I flew to Auckland this morning and if someone had told me, well, you've got a 67% chance of 67% chance of surviving the trip and the plane not crashing, but there's a 33% chance the plane will crash, I probably wouldn't get on the plane. So this is not a, a guilt-edged guarantee. To make to have the chance be 70 or 80 or 90%, percent we have to work much harder than that. And if we want to keep below um, one and a half degrees, well, the budget for carbon will be used up in a very short time, just in a matter of a few years. And back of the envelope calculation, I would say we would need to go to zero emissions very soon, within roughly one generation. And again, these negative emissions after that. So we need to work hard. There's a lot of talk. There's a great political momentum around this now, but we still haven't seen the carbon dioxide concentration starting to decrease, so we need to do a lot of work pretty urgently, I would say. And that was all I wanted to say, so thank you very much.